but we would be people that would put your word, your word into practice. Help us to be able to do this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take our scripture reading from Matthew chapter 16. I read from the verse 21 through to 23. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. Beloved, let us listen to the word of God. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Beloved, the word of God. This morning I speak to you on the theme... Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. And this message is a continuation of last week's sermon. After Peter had declared boldly to Christ Jesus that you are the Messiah, you are the Savior, you are the Son of the living God. The scripture says that after Peter had made this bold statement describing who Jesus was, Jesus began to tell them some activity, some things that must take place in his life. And these things that Jesus had planned to tell the disciples were things that were part of Jesus' ministry. It was part of God's agenda or God's plan for Jesus. God had brought Jesus on this earth to die so that you and I, we would have eternal life. John 3.16 says that, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him, that person would not die, but that person would have life eternal. So Jesus started telling the disciples that God brought me on this earth for a particular reason. And that reason is that I must die to save everyone in this world. So he says that there are a number of things that will happen to me. And he identified four things. Four things. He says that one, the Messiah, referring to himself, he must go to Jerusalem. Not any other place, but he says Jerusalem. He must go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem had a temple of God in those days. And it was a place that was known for animal sacrifice. Anybody that went to the temple would go and offer sacrifice unto God. So Jesus said four things to the people. And the first thing he was saying was that I must go to Jerusalem. Not Nazareth, not Bethlehem, not any other place but Jerusalem. Because it is a place that is known for sacrifices. And when he said I must go to Jerusalem, what he was saying is that I must go and offer myself as a sacrifice for this world. And I'm going to do the final sacrifice for humanity. So when you read 
the verse 21 of chapter 16. That is what he says. He says the first thing, I must go. Go to Jerusalem. The second thing is that I must suffer many things from the elders, from the chief priests, and from the scribes. When he talks of the elders, he's making reference to the respected people in Israel at the time. When he talks of the chief priest, he's making reference to these were, these were mostly Sadducees. Then the scribes were mostly Pharisees. He says that I must go through a lot of torture. I must go through a lot of suffering from these three categories of people that I have mentioned. The elders... The chief priests, the scribes. The third thing he said was that I must be killed. I must be crucified. And when you read the prophets, these things have been said about the Messiah who would come to this earth to deliver his people from their sins. And the fourth thing is that he says that I will not only go through suffering, but after I have been killed on the third day, I would resurrect. So four things. Going to Jerusalem, suffering many things at the hands of the religious leaders at the time, being killed, and on the third day, resurrecting again. And it's interesting to note that these four things that Christ Jesus made known to his disciples. He introduces these four things with a prefix. Must. Must. He uses the word must. In other words, what he's saying is that these four things that I have said to you, these are very important things. These are very essential things. These are things that I do not have any choice about. I do not have any alternatives. Come what may, I must go through these things. These four things that I have, I have said to you, they are not negotiable. I cannot negotiate about it. It must happen at all costs. The first lesson I want to present to you this morning is that you must be prepared to suffer for a purpose. Jesus was prepared to suffer for a purpose. He was prepared to go through pain he was prepared to go through distress. He was prepared to go through some hardship so that you and I, today we can boldly confess or profess that we are Christians. He was prepared to go through hardship so that God's agenda for his life will come to pass. For Jesus, he understood that suffering was also part of his life. And I want to present to you, dear one, listening to me this morning, that suffering and Christianity are inseparable. Suffering and Christianity are inseparable. What I'm trying to say is that we cannot separate suffering from Christianity. Anybody that says or calls himself or herself a Christian at some point in time will go through pain, will go through hardship, will go through difficult moments because you have decided to stand for Christ. Peter will tell us, that because Christ Jesus also went through suffering, you must be prepared to know that at some point in time, you being his disciple will also go through suffering. If you profess to be a Christian and you cannot suffer for the sake, for the sake of Christ, it raises a question mark about your faith. Today we want to go through a life without suffering. And we are always looking for shortcuts to life. We prefer to rather lie. We prefer to steal. We prefer to cheat. 
We will prefer to be dishonest in order to avoid a certain suffering that we need to go through. But listen to me carefully. It may benefit you temporarily, but the end may be disastrous. I am saying that there comes a time in our lives that we must go through suffering so that the will of God would be made manifest in our lives. Bear in mind that no price, no price, no cross, no crown, no pain, no gain, no test, no testimony. Endure that hardship that you are going through. And I know it will not be long. Just one day, when God pushes the button, things will turn in your favor. Things will turn in your favor. Things will turn in your favor. Hallelujah. Yes, you may be going through pain. You may be going through hardship. You may be going through tough times. For the sake of God, for the sake of Christ Jesus, I am saying hold on because it will not be too long. God will bring you that deliverance that you need. God is going to bring you that salvation that you need. God is going to bring you that help that you need. For sorrow may only endure for a night. But joy, 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 joy will always come in the morning. Hallelujah. So Jesus was prepared to go through suffering. The verse 22 says, Peter called him aside. And the scripture says that he began to rebuke him. He started rebuking his master. He started rebuking Jesus who was all-knowing. He started rebuking Jesus who was that powerful. He says, never Lord, this shall never happen to you. What Peter was trying to say is that God forbid this thing that you have said it will never come to pass he was saying that Jesus you are the Messiah that the prophet prophesied long ago that he will come and save your people from their sins if the Messiah would be killed by his enemies then you are a fake Messiah then you are a false Messiah then you cannot be that Messiah that was prophesied by the people of old so Jesus what you are saying it will not come to pass Jesus your people have been crying Jesus, your people have waited for far too long and they need deliverance from Roman oppression and we are looking up to you to bring salvation. How can you say that your enemies will kill you? Jesus, this must not come to pass. I hear Peter also saying, Remember, I was doing something meaningful. And you called me to become a fisher of men. I have left all that I have. I have made huge sacrifices because of you. All my efforts are going down the drain. After following you for three years, you are not telling me that you are going to be killed. It means that all the journeys that we did with you, all the sacrifices that we made for you, everything is gone down the drain. Wasted years. What are we gaining from you? So you can understand the kind of frustration that was going through Peter. So scripture says that he rebuked Jesus. And he said, God forbid this thing that you have said it will never come to pass but I see two things here I see God's will for Christ Jesus and I see man's will also for Christ Jesus 
The second lesson I want to present to you is about you discerning the will of God for your life. When I talk about discerning the will of God for your life, I am talking about you knowing the will of God for your life. Do you know the will of God for your life? So, when you put a yentia on your me, what do you be dear at the answer for us? I see you so. Do you know where God is taking you to? Do you know where God is leading you to? For Jesus, He knew why God brought Him on this earth. And so He would not allow Peter. To change the original plan of God for his life. Some of us, we don't even know why we are here. We cannot discern the will of God for our lives. What is God saying to you? Where is God leading you? There are things that will come in your way and there are distractions. The statement that was made by Peter, it sounded good. Because a man was going to die and he says that you cannot die. But that was not the plan of God for Jesus. The plan of God for Jesus was that Jesus must die so that the entire world would be saved. Do you know God's will for your life? You know God's will for your life. When the Apostle Paul, who at some point in time was persecuting the Christians, when he became saved, Scripture says that he was preaching Christ. And the people could not understand. Somebody that hated Christianity, now he was a champion of Christianity. He was promoting the Christian agenda. Bible says that when he was brought before the king called Agrippa. Acts chapter 26, the verse 19. He boldly declared to the king that I have made no wrong. That instruction that I had from God that instruction that I had from heaven, that is that same instruction that I am pushing through. The agenda that I had from God, the message that my God gave me, I'm still holding on to that message. So if you see me preaching about Christ and Him crucified, it is because God had given me a mandate and that is what I am doing. He was tortured. He was beaten. He went through pain. He went through challenges. But his mind will not change. Because he knew God's will for his life. So, that is the second thing I want you to know. Descend the will of God. The verse 23, the Bible says that Jesus turned to Peter and he made a very profound statement. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So from this statement that Jesus made, it was clear that Satan was using Peter as a medium, as a channel to obstruct the plan of God. Peter didn't really understand the plan of God. For him, it was about himself. But God was looking at a bigger picture. For God so loved the world. Not just one person, but the world in totality. Scripture says that Jesus rebuked Peter, the Satan, and said, Get behind me. And the third lesson I'm presenting to you is that. 
at some point in your life, you must be able to silence or you must be able to rebuke the enemy that works against your life. That enemy is what a human being. Because Paul tells us that that person that we are fighting, that person is actually a spirit being. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So for humans, they become medium. They become channels through which the enemy works. had declared that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of the living God. And not too long, the devil was working through the same person. Satan's greatest weapon is to use people who are closer to you to attack you. I'm saying Satan's greatest weapon is to use people that are closer to you to attack you. Joseph's brothers. They said, let us kill our brother and let us go and tell our father that an animal has devoured our brother. You put him in a pit. And his brother, Judah, sold him into slavery. David was attacked by his own son, Absalom. And he said, I desire my father's head on a silver platter. The same Jesus that we are talking about, later on we'll come to know that one of the people that was so close to him, Judas, would betray him. Satan's greatest weapon is to use the people that are close to you to attack you. The accounts will say, say, Abwe Bibekawa. Now, The devil is real. And the devil will do anything possible to obstruct God's plan for your life. The devil will fight anything that will bring elevation. Will fight anything that will bring progress. Will fight anything that will bring good things in your life. John 10.10 10, For the thief, that is the devil, cometh not, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. When you read 1 Thessalonians 2, the verse 18, this is Paul speaking. He says, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan, he specifically mentioned Satan. But Satan stopped us. But Satan blocked us. But Satan prevented us from coming to you. If Jesus rebuked Satan, then you and I, we cannot do less. We must also rebuke that power of darkness. We must also rebuke those principalities. We must also rebuke those spirits that work against us. The only language that Satan understands, it is not a language of diplomacy. It is not a language where you you, you talk things out with Satan, where you negotiate with with Satan, where you, you go through a form of dialogue with Satan. The only language that Satan understands very well is a language of warfare. It is a language of fight. It is a language of battle. And that language is done through prayer. You can only rebuke the devil. You can only rebuke Satan when you turn the gear to prayer. That is the only language that he understands. And that is what the Bible says that Jesus rebukes Satan and he says, 
get behind me. I pray this morning in the name of Jesus that any power of darkness, that any principality, that any aquatic power that is working against you, we declare in the name of Jesus that let that power get behind you. 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 Let every power that is stopping you from making progress in life, I declare in the name of Jesus, not in my name, but in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, and at the mention of that name, every knee bows, and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord, I declare in this name, that let the power get behind you. Let the power get behind you. We rebuke every power that is that is coming against, that is standing against your progress. Jesus came that you would have life. And you will have it in fullness. Receive life in fullness. Receive life in fullness. Receive life in fullness. In the name of Jesus. Begin to pray and rebuke every power of darkness. Let this be your prayer. Father, every power that is contending with my breakthrough, every power that is fighting my breakthrough, every power that is fighting me from fulfilling destiny, I come against that power. I come against that power. I come against that power in the name of Jesus. Any power that is working against you, we come against that power. Any power that is fighting your marriage, any power that is fighting your business, any power that is fighting your health, any power that is fighting your family, any power that is fighting your education, any power that is fighting your finances. I pray in the name of Jesus, may that power get behind you. 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 Powers of darkness projecting death against your life, it will not come to pass. Powers of darkness projecting Projected accidents against your life, it will not come to pass. Powers of darkness projecting delayed marriage against your life, it will not come to pass. Powers of darkness projecting barrenness on you, it will not come to pass. I pray in the name of Jesus, may that power, may that power, let it get behind you. That power is getting behind you. That power is getting behind you. That power is getting behind you. Begin to rebuke that power. Begin to rebuke that power. That power of stagnation. For a very long time, you cannot move beyond a certain limit. You cannot move beyond a certain limit. You would advance one step. Then all of a sudden, you go two steps backwards. I come in the name of Jesus. And I rebuke every power that is bringing stagnation in your life. May that power be destroyed. 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 Power be destroyed. Power be destroyed. For some of us, we We've been taken to fetish. We've been taken to the old quarters to destroy us, to destroy us, to destroy us. But I declare in the name of Jesus, the awakens will not work against you. It will not come to pass. We neutralize any power of the devil. We render every power of the devil useless. We declare in the name of Jesus, may that power take its filthy hands off your life. May that power take its Filthy hands of life. May that power take its filthy hands to your life in the name of Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Get 
get behind me, Satan. May Satan get behind you. May Satan get behind you. May Satan get behind you. Any ancestral powers, any bloodline curses, any bloodline curses, any patterns of the bloodline that is working against you, may it get behind you. The patterns in your father's household will not affect your life. The patterns in your mother's household, I am saying it will not affect your life. Those negative patterns that runs through the family minus you in the name of Jesus. The only language that the devil understands, it is not the language of diplomacy. I am saying to you, it is a language of warfare. May God fight your battles for you. May the Lord fight your battles for you. Bible says that our God is called a God of war. If there are no battles to be fought, he would not be called a God of war. I pray in the name of Jesus, may the God of war fight your battles for you. Bible says that he rebuked the Satan. And he said, you have evil intent for me. You want to obstruct the plan of God for my life. I'm praying the last prayer with you. That you would fulfill destiny. I am saying you would fulfill destiny. You would not operate below your destiny. You would not operate below your destiny. You would fulfill the plan of God for your life. May God grant you the strength. May God grant you the grace to be able to fulfill destiny in the name of Jesus. This is our last prayer. Declare boldly that I would fulfill destiny. I would fulfill destiny. I will fulfill destiny. I will not operate below destiny. Oh, what God has said to me, it will materialize in my life. Some